Welcome, everybody. So good to see you. As I was explaining, this was our February program here at the Senior Center, and then we had that uh, sort of little bit of snow, rain mix that, that delayed our uh, start. But I'm glad that you, the anticipation must have uh, grown, and good to see everybody here today. So we're going to take a look. I hope it's going to be a fun, fun presentation. It's going to take a look at what was going on 100 years ago in Belmont. So we're going to look at the year 1923. And it's fun to see. You'll, you'll see how many things are similar or are almost the same. And then what's really, really been a lot of changes to the town. So without uh, further ado, we're going to say uh, centennial, let the centennial celebration begin. So first of, uh, of all, we're looking at some population statistics, which are really pretty dramatic. So you see, in 1910, the population of Belmont in the 5,000. And then in, in just 10 years, double. And then again, doubled in the next 10 years. So really a period of extreme growth and development. And, and, in the town, and you'll and you'll see what the impact of go through the slides. So to tell the story, um, you know, telling the story of what was going on, a, it, you know, hundred years ago, I, I I sort of divided into chapters, which I call themes. So that some of the themes that we're going to take a look at is town of homes, community life, civic, town topics, prominent citizen and politics. Churches, clubs, organizations, sports and recreation, school days, and finally business and commerce. So we're going to take a look at, at those um, categories as we flip through the slides. So first off is town of homes. And as you can imagine, with the population increase so dramatic, what that means uh, for the landscape. So here we see that... Um, uh, the, the new construction during 1922 was valued over two and a quarter million dollars. But 1923 actually broke records and the total amount of uh, permits uh, in 1922 was 520 and 682 in 1923. So you see the incredible um, surge in building. So record-breaking year, big gain in residentials, and not only families, but now we see garages starting to, to, to make a, a, an appearance. Because before this, cars, I mean, we, we take it for granted nowadays, but cars really weren't the, all that popular. Uh, you know, up until, you know, maybe 19, a little bit after that. But now you see that people are starting to make room for their vehicles as well as homes. And even some building blocks are going to come on the scene now in this new surge of building. So I thought it would be fun to take a look at some of the developments that actually sprung up. And there are quite a few. This, this is um, the Horn property. And um, it was a new development, about 10 acres were developed. And this, par this parcel, it's more generally known as the Samuel Barnard Estate. Uh, and it had been in the family, the Barnard family, for more than 200 years before this. So anyone, anyone know where the Barnard Estate is? Or this, this property? This is over where, um, mm, up, in, up in Cushing Square, above, up on, up on Cushing, uh, up in the Cushing Square, area and um, it's located between Trapella Road and Belmont Street up on, up on that section that was a Barnard homestead and, and that whole area there so um, it I like to read the ads that appeared in the in the newspaper so this one says um, it's one of the most desirable properties in this district and it says, the purchaser who secures one of these lots can consider we've done him a favor in giving him the opportunity uh, to buy a piece of land in one of the best sections of Belmont. So, so if you live in the Horn Estate, congratulations. So I don't know who's, who's from that area. And this, this was a 
developed by Edward T. Harrington Company, and he's, again, a popular builder in Belmont. And kind of the quote about him, making a hundred homes spring up, but one pre previously existed. The company's well-known throughout suburban Boston. So he was a well-known builder. So now we're taking a look at another batch of ads in the Belmont Citizen, all from the 20s, all from 1923, and we're gonna do the same thing, go through where these properties are located. Anyone know the Lockhart Estate? I saw Peg here, Peg Demerit. Mine's in Chenery. Chenery, Lockhart Chenery, was the oh. same area. Yep, so it was off Common Street. Yeah, right. Yep, that, that whole area there yeah, off the... the yeah, so that, that's the Lockhart Estate. And this, this advertisement says the pride of this beautiful suburb uh, is carefully restricted to a high class residential section whose stately shade trees and wonderful views are everything the heart could wish for in a location for a home, for the lover of the best. So if you're in the Lockhart Estate, that's, uh, that's uh, along Common Street. And now the Jackson home sites are being built, and that's over by the Payson Park area. Anyone live in that section of town? Yeah, I see a couple of hands, yep. Okay, and that's another one, and it's uh, saying that this property is ideal for families who want to locate their homes in a section that's already settled by some of the finest people in Belmont. Uh, when there's ample um, bre oh, sorry, where there's ample breathing space for children to play and plenty of space for gardens, lawns, and shrubbery. So if you live over where the Jackson Estate is, that's uh, how that was described. The Stultz Estate, now that's another uh, location diagonally opposite the Oakley Country Club in that section of town. And... Um, it's, now that advertisement says, for many years, residents of Belmont have looked with longing eyes upon this splendid location, hoping that they might be fortunate enough to be able to buy a piece of land to erect a residence. So there you have it, the Stoltz Estate was another development. And finally, the Paul Free Estate, and that's um, situated near, near where the Stoltz Estate actually is. Uh, and that, that part of town as well. Um, in the most beautiful part of Belmont, electric cars pass it and everyone agrees it's the most beautiful and convenient residential property in greater Boston. All the houses on the tract are practically sold before they're completed. So there's a, another uh, real estate of the, uh, the Palfrey. So you see that this is, this is typical of what was in the newspaper. House plans, advertises for building, um, for wood, for uh, construction materials. A lot of, lot of 1923, it seemed, was devoted to this really this house boom that we're looking at. And all these, um, these kinds of uh, estates were developed one by one, streets laid out, lots put on, I mean houses put on there, and then sold off for market. So that's uh, kind of why this section is called Belmont, the town of homes. So community life, we'll take a look then. And, and, and who's been to, who, who, who remembers Norbega Park? Yeah, lots of you. And so this wasn't in Belmont, but I thought this, is, this sort of kicks off our community life section. But we're going to take a look at what was going on in Belmont and more barn. Yeah, yeah, that's a very popular uh, hangout spot. And uh, most of you can remember, have fond memories of that. But movies in Belmont, they got their start when the Waverly Unitarian Society on Lexington Street started a community motion picture to extend its usefulness, it says, to the community by showing first-class films. <clears throat> so in 1919, the groundbreaking took place for a block of stores on the, com the corner of Trapello and Beach Street, and that's where this Strand Theater opened. So in 1923, they were showing Robin Hood, starring Douglas Fairbanks, 
and it enjoyed a wonderful four-day run. And it was um, so popular, I guess, after that, that the business, they decided to petition. The owners appeared before the selectmen asking for a permit to conduct Sunday movies. Sunday movies. Imagine. But the opposition uh, it, it caused, it was so dramatic, the opposition, this request, and it was greeted uh, that, that they withdrew the request to, at the meeting, and it was greeted with thunderous applause. So that put an end to the Sunday movies until about 1950. And then despite the opposition from the Belmont Religious Council, they actually passed that and allowed the, the um, studio theater to be open. So kind of an interesting, um, uh, you know, history of that. Um, 1923, it said a new orchestral organ was installed. The local papers reported the theater has been enjoying a splendid patronage during the past week with the famous picture Robin Hood. So uh, that's what you're looking at, the, uh, the inside. Uh, it was called the Studio Theater, the Strand Theater, and then the barn, I think. The, and now it's a church. Yes, thank you. Bringing it up to date. 100 years later, it's a church. Forget having Sunday movies. Yeah, that's a, that's a uh, full circle we've come. OK, so we're looking at, uh, again, a little bit of community life. And this is, uh, this is part of the, the collection that's held by the Belmont Historical Society, some of our artwork, and also hung in the library so you can enjoy these pieces even now. And these were painted by the Burbank sisters. And you may all know uh, Mary Lee Burbank because the school was, on School Street was named after her. And she started teaching when she was 18 years old. And uh, she retired after 42 years. And uh, eventually the school was named, when they built it, to honor her service to the town. But this is her sisters. And it seems that her sisters were artists and painters. They also taught in the Belmont School System. So the, the, the article you saw was in transcript. And it was reprinted in the local paper. And it was talking about their exhibit at the Vose Gallery in Boston. And these sisters, uh, both Amy Luella and Clara Eliza, will be on display at the Vose Gallery for the next few weeks. And it seems that uh, the sisters had a place, or the family had a place in Ashburn, Mass. And um, they would spend some the time in the summers there. So during their summer months, maybe they were off with teaching, and they would paint and, and be inspired by the scenery and some still lives. So that's a collection of, we hold it as part of our collection of artwork that's local history. So I thought that would be an interesting little connection. OK, now we're looking at uh, Memorial Day. We're going to have a, a celebration. And the Grand Army and the American Legion are making plans for that. And um, people, I hope, recognize this, this uh, Civil War plaque. Anyone see the location of that? Town Hall. It's in the entryway of the Town Hall. It's a bronze plaque that, that commemorates the names of those who lost their lives in the Civil War. And there were uh, six residents from Belmont. And uh, that, that set there. And you see the sons of the Civil War veterans. So this group was dedicated to sort of carrying on the memory of their father. So they're posed on the steps of the town hall and the plaques in behind. So it's talking about their plans for a, a fitting observance of Memorial Day. So that's uh, something going on in, in, uh, around town. Now this is a, like I told you, that the building of garage is kind of a, a new idea. But here we have fines being imposed because apparently people were driving without a license. So they, I don't know, who knew you needed a license? So they got a car, and then they drove them around the streets of Belmont. And they had a, a, a big crackdown with the local police cooperating with the registry of motor vehicles, if you can imagine that, and uh, trying to, to, to clear the public streets of all these, these people driving around in, uh, without a license. So that was kind of what was 
uh, making the headlines in um, 1923. Okay, another, another thing uh, that was going on in, in uh, the 4th of July celebrations, and it's reporting that it was very quiet this year with no observance of a public name whatsoever. But during the night before, there was evidence of liberal imbibing of moonshine on the part of a, an occasional, an, an occasional complaint of mischief that was brought to the attention of the police. But on the whole, the department didn't have too many problems. So that's the 4th of July uh, quiet, kind of under the radar article talking about what was happening on that holiday. All right, let's see what we've, we've got in store for Civic. And if, if, if any of you came to the recent lecture of the Historical Society, we featured a retired Chief William Osterhouse, and that was a, a wonderful uh, look back through the fire department. And so you, you might have remembered that uh, guard, so to speak, and you see that um, Chief William Hill, um, is coming on is coming on board and he's uh, taking the place of John Leonard who was there for several years so chief hill um, replaces him and 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 starts his tenure on the fire department and really um, in many ways it's saying that this will mark a most important transition in, Bi in Belmont's fire department a passing from a small town firefighting you to a department on par with other towns. Before that, there was a lot of volunteer and a lot of part-time. And I guess uh, it's saying that with the appointment of this chief, it, it was really thought of as a regular uh, department. So that's uh, something starting in 1923. Okay, and good thing we have a fire department because we had a disastrous fire at Waverly. And anyone recognize this area of Waverly? I, yeah, yeah. This is this is the site of um, today's Star Market. Yeah, yes. This is over on off a of Trapello, and that was uh, Edgar's Floors for many years, and that was a uh, second oldest business in Belmont. Started in the 1800s, after uh, the the. Mr. Edgar died, his wife carried it on with a partner for many, many years. And uh, looks like what was happening is that um, they had some greenhouses and storage sheds and um, there was some, the cause, they, they're calling it spontaneous combustion of some soft coal which created a gas and exploded causing, uh, igniting a, a, a fire in, in the greenhouses. You know, at, at that time, all these greenhouses were heated by usually coal. So that was very common to have those things around in the greenhouses. And so the article is talking about, uh, you know, uh, the night watchman uh, noticing the fire and calling the alarm and the firemen responding so that it didn't spread throughout the greenhouse complex. Because you see there are many other buildings that it would have affected, but the fire department was successful in extinguishing the fire and, and uh, saving the other parts of the business. So a nice look back at Edgar's. Okay, and this one is baffling to me, so I'll, I'll let you know what you think of it. Because the headline is the expected happens. So when you read the article, I, I'm not sure what the expected, the article is about some boys from, uh, from um, from Watertown pulling an alarm box, I don't know, maybe as a prank, but, but the fire department responds in their horse-drawn apparatus and coming, out, uh, coming around the bridge under the underpass, in the sharp curve that's created there, they lose a wheel, the, the wishbone rig breaks, and they go and they smash into a stone wall, and there's this big mishap going on, so I, I'm not sure what, what was expected. The false alarm, the, 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 fire, the fire department having an accident. Uh, so it, it's kind of a funny way to advertise the headline, but that's basically telling you that the rear wheel bro broke off 
and it continued with three wheels until it stopped up against a tree. And, and, and you'll be happy to know that eventually the police apprehended the, two bo the, the boys and their two companions, and they were all brought, brought to the police station. So that's what's going on. Uh, but you can, you can remember the, the Central Fire, the headquarters station, which is Il Casal Restaurant now down in the center. And if you were at the fire talk, we, we talked about the horse-drawn apparatus there and actually grooves in the cement floor that guided the wheels in and out, in and out of the buildings. And they were there up until the time that it was renovated actually for a restaurant. So kind of an interesting trivia when you went inside the building, you could see the, see, see the, the grooved wheels. So looking at the... That's going on there. All right, and this, uh, again, this, this uh, World War I m memorial, and that to you, you should recognize from the Delta, down by Common Street and, and Concord Avenue there. And it was in 1923, I think in July, that they had a groundbreaking for this, they, they're proposing the new, the, the new Veterans Monument be erected, and that's, uh, in honor of the men who lost their lives in World War I, and they're all um, listed on the back. So the groundbreaking was in July. The, the monument's made out of um, Bethel, uh, m uh, sorry, granite that came from a quarry in Bethel, Vermont, and uh, very handsomely dedicated. And then later on that, in that November is when it was unveiled and actually they had a ceremony and it was dedicated uh, during on Armistice Day. And um, uh, interesting to note that uh, the mother of Carlton Parquin, who was the first boy in Belmont wounded in the service, and he also later died, so he is on the monument, and she was there to unveil and to dedicate the monument at the time. So uh, kind of interesting. And a little bit of trivia for you is that a um, vet uh, man who lost his life that was from Belmont was recently added to the monument. So in, in addition to the nine names that have been there since probably it was erected, uh, they found, a, uh, they, they did some research and, um, and decided that this uh, a tenth man, John Kamir, was to be added. So that's been done recently. I don't know if you remember the year on that, but in the... It, yeah, about five, yeah, I would say that. Within the recent, in the recent history. So there's the, the, the dedication of the monument happening in 23, and again, full circle that we've corrected the mistake to have a tenth name added to the back of the monument for a, for a veteran that's, that's no longer with us. Okay, let's take a look at town topics. That's Concord Avenue, if you can take a look at that. And uh, this, was, this was kind of a fun, um, <laughs> well, fun in a way. You see that the, the streetcar is coming from way, you know, along the route to Waverly. And you see the uh, Butler School, the old Butler School and the church that was no longer with us. And then this is along Concord Avenue. So the two routes, uh, one through Waverly and one through Concord Avenue. However, what, what, what they wanted to do was to be able to switch between those two lines. So they were requesting that the five cent fare um, that you had to pay to ride the subway if you made the switch to the other line on, on that would have been on Grove Street to come into Belmont, uh, that you wouldn't have to pay twice. But, no, that, 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 that the Boston Elevated Trustees said that at the present time, that's inexpedient to grant the nickel fare ride between Waverly and Belmont Center. So you can't get there from here unless you want to pay again. So that's what the article is talking about, that they wanted to make it so that once you got on the trolley, you could make it from in town all the way out to Belmont Center. But uh, that, that didn't happen. So 
Uh, next, we have uh, McLean Hospital, and, and many of you know that McLean Hospital started, started back in 1882. It's, it's already celebrated its 100th anniversary, and uh, so it's been there many years. But they have a, a lot of firsts in that hospital, and um, one of them was they, they opened the first school of nursing to be or, organized in a psychiatric hospital, and later they became the first mental institution to introduce women nurses in male wards. They had a lot of firsts at McLean Hospital. This we're taking a look at in this article was all about forming an alumni association for the many graduates from these probably nursing programs. So this was a, a reunion of sorts and uh, returning graduates from all across the US and Canada came together and they elected their first president and I want you to know the day's activities, it wasn't all business, it included a luncheon, a baseball game with the male nurses, a social hour, a banquet, uh, and a, a social, yeah, social and banquet. So th that's what was going on there uh, at the hospital. Hospital, the McLean Hospital, again, to us, and it's although it's in Belmont, it's sort of tucked away in its own, uh, its own little um, enclave. So we don't always hear hear that much about it. But it, but it was included in 1923 for the, for this reason, starting a new new association. Oh yeah, here's here's a good one. So you know, this is over on Mill Street, and. Uh, the strong room at the local police headquarters now resembles the stock room of a bar on the palmiest of pre-Volstead days. So they raid over on Mill Street. Now you, you remember this was all during the time of prohibition years in, 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 uh, in the country. And so they raided, they raided this uh, location and they confiscated the highest grade liquor valued at $5,000. That's a few bottles, you know? And so they were saying that uh, they had 50 sealed cases of genuine Scotch whiskey in quart bottles, large quantities of gin and pint bottles and wine. So this was all um, confiscated uh, between the Belmont and Cambridge police cooperating over on the Mill Street uh, side of town. So there was, a, there was said to, I mean, the, we, the Historical Society has several locations around town that were known as speakeasies, operated as speakeasies during this time. Prohibition, I think it started in 1919 and it ended in 1933. So this falls in the window of, of, uh, of the, 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 the raid. So big, big happenings in Belmont. Another uh, transportation um, kind of a slide here. And this is the taking of a 25 foot strip for the railway grounds. And this is over in Waverly. So you can recognize, uh, it's hard to see in this picture, but you see the, the bigger slide here and there. There used to be two stations, two railroad tracks in Waverly. One was operated by the Central Main and the other one was by Fitchburg. The Fitchburg station here is bigger with a little Porsche here covered. And this is the Central Main Line, both on either side of that delta there area. So kind of uh, an interesting look at the station. But uh, what, what the trivia question is, and what I wanted to draw your attention to, is this. Anybody recognize what this could be sitting in? There you go, a horse trough. OK, in Belmont Center on the delta, out in front of the savings bank. There's the companion to this trough right here. And so this is the second one that was purchased at the same time. And this one was put over in this site. So this was, again, a watering trough for the horses. And so you can easily see it appearing in the picture here. But once they did some um, widening, and, and you know they lowered, lowered the tracks in the 50s, and I think that's what appeared. So it no, no longer exists that we know of. So it, we lost that trough there in the 50s when they put the tracks. This was a, this was a particularly 
I think, dangerous crossing, they felt, because it crossed the street at grade in two different places. So it was kind of um, um, you know, an accident waiting to happen, probably. And that's why they, they agreed to, to lower the tracks and put it all now under, underground in that section of town. But so there's, there it is. So you can see this, the second watering trough right there in the picture in the corner. OK, let's take a, take a look at some of our prominent citizens, some triumphs and some tragedies in this section. First is a tragedy, and this is the 11th president um, of the United States passed away on August 2nd, 1923. And so the newspaper around that time was filled with um, commemorative stories and, and memorial services in Belmont. And I'm sure the whole, uh, you know, across the nation mourning the death of um, Warren Harding. And so anyone remember who was he replaced by? It's Coolidge, Coolidge. So we'll see him in the next slide. So Calvin Coolidge takes over. As, um, as the president shortly after he passed away. And I think this is an interesting quote. And it's, it's saying, the untimely death of President Harding, occurring at a comparatively youthful age when he should have normally had many years of usefulness ahead of him, leads many people to ask whether the American people do not work their presidents too hard. That's the problem. The duties of this great office have become so tremendous and exacting that any man who undertakes them risks his health and life in the effort. So there's, there you have it. So, so that was uh, what was saying um, a lot of uh, articles that were talking about. Uh, I think at the time he passed, he was on a tour in the West Coast out in San Francisco. And he did a lot of shaking of hands and greeting people. And this they said he was probably so overworked and exhausted. So that's one. another little trivia that I thought you'd be interested in is um, something special about Calvin Coolidge. And he was sworn in on August 3rd, 1923. Anyone uh, have any idea what, what might be different about his sworn in ceremony? There you go. Wow. Can't get, very good. He's the only president to be sworn in by his father. You're right. And the father was a notary public, so I guess he was qualified to do that. And he, the father swore in uh, the son for president. So that's another little trivia. Uh, win you some points someday when you need to know that. OK, now more on a local level. And I'm sure you, you've, you've all heard the name Flett and probably Jay Watson Flett. Because, uh, he was considered, or became to be known as Mr. Belmont. And uh, in, in, many, in many ways, considered the most dominant figure on the political scene this century. I mean, he, he, he really uh, dominated politics for many years in Belmont. But we're taking a picture of the young Jay Watson. And I think this he was elected state representative from Belmont in 22, and next as selectman in 24. So he held this position for 39 years. So you can imagine like the, 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 um, the spread of his, of his influence. So we're looking at his start, and, and particularly uh, in 1923, we didn't hit the we didn't hit the uh, signing in for s selectman or state rep. But in 23, he was elected the worst uh, worst worshipful master of the Belmont Lodge. So that's why this appeared in the paper in 1923 because they're installing him to head the the uh, the lodge, the Belmont Lodge. So that's uh, J. Watson Flett. OK, now we have um, a, a, a nice look at James Brown of Belmont. And he was from uh, 45 Common Street, his family lived. And uh, this article, he was part of a ceremony receiving medal, extraordinary heroism on the field of battle. And this is just describing 
what, what was t taking place, um, that he, he, he took over the mission and he led and, and disregard for his own safety, coolness under fire, leadership, and so he's inspiring his men and enabling them uh, in the face of concentrated machine gun fire to take the town, making it possible for the advanced troops of his division on both sides. So he's being cited at a in on Boston Common, and um, one of our Belmont heroes from World War I. Next, we have uh, Kevin. Has a, you know, an amazing and distinguished military history, uh, and he's he's now being honored at the, I think at that same ceremony on Boston Common with a Distinguished Service Medal. But we're talking about today. Anyone know where the where the where the monument in this memorial to Kevill is in Belmont? Yes. So this is in Belmont, and you're looking at the stone and bronze plaque that was placed there, again, in the recent, recent history, to replace one that was previously there that had been lost or got misplaced. This has been restored, and it's down on the delta by the commuter train station. Yeah, so this is a nice monument, and also um, Kevil that was from, from Belmont. All right, another swearing in is taking place, and this is J.R. Benton. He's the youngest man to become uh, Chief Law Officer of the Commonwealth. He was born in January 1923, and so that name should be familiar because um, the Bentons, again, were uh, familiar around town, and I put a little bit of a blurb, I think, about Colonel and Mrs. Benton because they happen to be the fourth and final owner of the house Belmont, the Belmont Mansion, 50-room mansion that named the town. That's why the town is named Belmont. It's named from the estate of John Perkins Cushing and the house uh, four owners and the final owner were the Benton family. So. Still in town, uh, we have Cushing Square, we have Payson Park area. Those are all associated with that particular house. But anyone remember or, or know what we have that commemorates the Benton name? Library. Yes, the library over it uh, in that section of town, the Benton Library, and that was gifted by the Benton family to the town. Uh, and so he's being, he's being in um, as the state attorney general, 1923. Okay, another, another tragedy that year, and this is another very prominent Belmont family, uh, that's the Atkins family, and they're all, I, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure, well known uh, throughout the town, even still, and they lost their son, Edwin F. Atkins, in kind of a, a, a uh, freak accident. As you know, the money with sugar, and they had sugar plantations in Cuba. And so uh, Edwin had taken business and taken over some of the operations of the Cuba sugar plantation, and they were flying in a small plane from Key West to Havana. And there was some engine problems during the flight, and the plane, the pilot uh, tried to put the plane in the water landing, and um, the, the father and his two young sons, both Edwin III, five-year-old, and Dave, three-year-old, along with the governess, all died in the accident. Uh, what what, what uh, happened after that that was kind of more unsettling, and that's the wife and a friend who were also in the plane survived in the water for about a half an hour, I think they said, uh, desperately survi survived there until a ferry boat sent, sent a lifeboat to pick them up. And they were actually recovered and survived the, the, the whole ordeal and were taken back to, to uh, Florida to recover that. 
but a, quite a tragedy. Anytime it's a young person, it's a sudden death, and there's no real reason, no preparation for it. It's very jarring, I think. And so this is, this is a case in all of Belmont. It was a ve very big loss for the town and for the family to, to have the, this Atkins death, his young, yeah, the young member of his family, the young children. Okay, so let's see. We're taking a look a little bit at local politics. And so three, three articles I clipped, and that's uh, progress is made on the warrant, which the longest on record for Belmont. I'm sure they'd be amazed at the, the length of the warrant nowadays, but at the time, that was uh, uh, about, about talking about town meeting warrants. And then a uh, second one that I thought was interesting is that um, a committee of 15 will be named and appointed by the moderator to investigate the advisability of the town adopting a re representative form of government, which is what we have now with the, with the town meeting members and precincts. So we, we obviously adopted somewhere along this representative form of government. So that, that's what, 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 where the discussion was happening during 1920. And finally, we're talking about constructing a schoolhouse um, on Washington Street. Also, this is a memorial of the World War I. So these are the topics that seem to be um, ongoing political topics in 1923. So that's a little bit of wrapping up that category. So great. So amazingly enough, every, every week in the papers, there, there's uh, articles submitted by the local churches. And it really um, reminded me, I think, of how connected the social life and the activities were around the different churches and religious organizations. And really, they, they had activities, balls, dinners, dances, fairs, um, along with their re religious activities of you know, weddings and Bible studies and everything. It, it really was almost like the center of um, community life and social life for a long time happened around the activities of all these churches in town. So it, it, it just brought me back to that, that time, I guess, in history where that was really the case. And there was about, let me see, I'm at about 10 churches on the list that every week would list their activities, would list the names of the pastor would list their services. And I think that tradition went um, even, even recent, more recently in the Belmont Citizen. You could, there was a little worship section where you could find out what was going on and happening. But, but the, I, I captured some of the articles so you could take a look at what was going on in these churches. Um, first of all, the Payson Park Church. Payson Park Church was celebrating their 10th anniversary. See, they were... Uh, having a special celebration uh, and exercises covering two days because uh, they were celebrating, uh, yes, what, all the activities that were geared to celebrating 10 years in the community. And it was in 2013 that they actually celebrated their 100th anniversary. So they are also over the 100 mark. And uh, the Historical Society attended that service. But so Payson Park, early church in Belmont, and uh, Waverly Unitarian Church now, they're celebrating three different anniversaries in this, in this uh, slide, 40 years since the foundation of the society, 26 years since the dedication of the church, and 25 years since the ordination of the pastor. This is the Unitarian Society, and this building still exists. And um, this was organized in 1882. They first met in Waverly Hall on Church Street. And uh, it's saying for many years, the church was a center of liberal religion in the Waverly area. But you may know them as the first church Unitarian on Concord Avenue because they merged. Eventually, this Unitarian group merged the group that's on the, on the corner of Concord Avenue and Common Street and they became the Unitar first church Unit Unitarian. So this, this group merged with the other group. So that's taking a look at their anniversaries happening. And of course, St. Luke's. 
celebrating some stones. One of them is the, the pastor is celebrating his own jubilee. And then you have a, a gala event. And uh, this, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Um, and this street. And the grounds were open from noon to midnight. And the parish was divided into four districts with a captain and a committee in each. This is, this is pretty serious stuff. The festivities included a concert, music for dancing, booths with sale items, refreshments, and fireworks. So this is the kind of thing that was, I think, pretty common for these churches to be doing around town. It's also looking at, uh, they're having a ball for their 50th anniversary as well. So kind of the things that capture the headlines and the attention in the newspaper. This I just put in because we're looking at the Benton. This is the Benton Chapel that we were just talking about. And this is where several churches got their start. So I put in the little slide about the Benton um, that's when it was a chapel, not a library. And finally, we have the and the Methodists um, are again holding some of their services here. Uh, and the Methodist Church is kind of an interesting in the news recently, you know, being sold, going to be sold, I guess. And the church was built in stages, so it's kind of interesting. You see they're starting to erect the second floor, but at the first, you know, if, you, if you've ever been there for the parking lot, there's almost like an underground walkout. That was the original building, until they saved up some more money and added to their coffers, and then they decided to expand to what it looks like today. But the funny story is Reverend Imler, and you know next door to this building, the Imler House. Any, anyone know the yeah, Methodists and know the Imler House? And Reverend Imler was a fixture there again for many, many years, well known. But this, I, I like this little story about, uh, he made his pastoral call Columbia Bicycle, and it was loaned to him by a charter member. But in 1923, the Imlers bought a secondhand Model T. Now, how did they do that, you're wondering? Well, Mrs. Imler had to go without a new hat for two years. OK? But, but they both felt that the sacrifice, plus all they had saved, would allow them to purchase a Ford. And it would be a big help in the ministry. I don't know what, I, I can't imagine what hats cost in 1923. <laughs> But I'm thinking, if I went without a new hat for two years, I don't think I could buy a car. <laughs> but the Immlers somehow did that. And uh, well, all seemed good. And how proud they were when they started on their first ride, only to two flat tires. So I guess she should have gone without a hat for three years, maybe, <laughs> and put the little extra money into a better model. I, I, I don't know that the moral of the story is there, but the, the Immlers, I don't know. Uh, and this, this was like, a, this was really the classic, so I'm, I'm ending the church section with this, because this, this was a, the, the Methodist making Mary at a marshmallow roast. The details. So, they, they, um, they had a moonlight drive, and the, the party met at the church and with some 25 machines, that means cars, in line, they drove to the Cary Farm in Lexington. And it says, the, uh, under the auspices of a Bible class, the men of the parish held a ladies' night in the form of a moonlight drive and marshmallow roast. This is under the auspices of a Bible class. So uh, the people met at the church, and they... Um, <clears throat> in advance, there was an advance team at the site, and they were digging a 40-foot trench on the hill overlooking the reservoir, and the fire was started when the first auto came into view, and it was burning merrily, and they, as a party arrived and gathered around this 40-foot trench on fire to roast some marshmallows, I guess. And they had, well, they also had popcorn and roasted weenies. And they were consumed in large quantities. They wanted to report that. So that was uh, what all went happened uh, according to the church. And after this, the event included with a 20-mile drive about the countryside. 
So that's how they ended the marshmallow roast. Uh, but this is the kind of, like I said, activities that are very, I would say, heavily featured throughout the 20s at least, and, and also in 23, because that's what I'm taking the information from. But uh, through the churches, it were, they really were the center of that kind of community activity and socialization. So kind of interesting. That's on Common Street. It's on Cushing Square, up at Cushing Square. Yes, Paul Free, and it's on Common Street. And it's right when you're coming into Cushing Square. Yeah, and that's the one that's, that's up for uh, sale, I think, recently, I think. Okay, we're going to take a quick, another quick lo look through cl some clubs and organizations. And this, this is a, not far from here. This is a home of um, Henry Harris, which is down on Waverly Street across from the town field. And Harris was a big uh, uh, importer of Morgan horses, and he was, uh, had a, owned a lot of land. And the town field was actually purchased from his estate. So across there, the house is still up on the hill. You remember the house with a horse and stable that was along that strip? There was a barn behind it. This is, this is his house. So this is a Henry Harris house. So I guess they, they purchased the property on Waverly Street, and this is the Knights of Columbus. And they're going to take possession of this, and they're going to use this for their clubhouse, apparently. And they... Um, they're working to do that. Harris, um, I told you he horse exchange and bought. He also sold and rented horses to the town for highway and snow plowing. So a lot of um, you know dealers dealing with the town. So the the town field is a four four point eight acres that uh, came from his estate. Also the Odd Fellows, it looks like the lodge of Waverly is going to erect a modern hall on Maple Street. And I think that still stands there today, the Odd Fellows Hall. Kind of funny, because it's sort of in this residential uh, type neighborhood, but um, I don't know if it's, it's, the building is there. I don't know how frequently it's used or if that group is still um, popular. But, but it started here in, in 1923 when uh, they were going to build this new hall. Okay, and this is, this is another interesting um, slide, only because talking about the Italian Workmen's Society. So, uh, as you all probably remember, there was a large Italian population in Belmont, and um, you could join this, this society, and it was kind of uh, they pretty much all seem to do this, and some of the benefits are listed here. They took care of you and paid you if you're out of work and visited you and this kind of thing. And so they're having, a, they're having a parade and christening of the flags and some fireworks. So it's funny, when you read the parade route, where, what streets it went along, because you can see where the heavy, heavily Italian populations lived when you, I'll read the list of streets. So it was down on Oak, I'm oh, sorry, Trapella Road. It went to Hawthorne, Cambridge, Grant Ave, Waverly. Oh, sorry, got to start at the beginning. Beach, Maple, Chestnut, Loring, Walnut Hill, Sycamore, Lexington, um, Church, Trapello, Hawthorne, Cambridge, Grant Ave. So down around that, all that area. Then it went on School Street to Concord Avenue, but it went down the boot, Underwood, Trowbridge, Hamilton, so it took in sort of, the, they rooted the parade where the heavy concentration of these Italian, Italians were. And then it, it continued on to the town hall where they had the christening of the flags and some musical programs and speakers and refreshment, refreshments and then they had fireworks. So this was again, was a kind of a look back in the past about uh, how they, celebrated in Belmont. And of course, the women's club, uh, the women's club, uh, that movement began to sweep the nation in the 1800s and through, through, the, through the 1920s, it was very popular, a movement to have these women's clubs. So the Belmont club was organized in 1920 um, when some women got together and decided that uh, they wanted to get in on this women's club movement. And they had a um, membership of about 400 people 
pretty, pretty, pretty easily after that. Um, so every week, pretty much in the paper, there's information about their activities. And that's well publicized and talking about fairs, dances, craft shows, all kinds of things that they sponsored and held at, the, at, at uh, around town. They didn't own the property that they are in now, the William Flagg Homer House, till about 1927, I think they bought it. So you see they're sitting on the stairway that used to be up on the lawn there, on the front lawn of the property, which is gone now, the stairway. But this was later because this, they didn't buy this property until later in the 20s. So they used to meet at the town hall mostly, I think, or, or the library, or different spaces around town. But always, every week, you can find out what's happening at the women's club because they'll have an article in the paper. OK, let's look at some. There you go. Yeah. Let's look at some sports and recreation. And first of all, this is nearby as well. And this is the Belmont Tennis Club. And it's the, I think it's the second oldest uh, tennis club in the country, still active. We just went by it when we're on the way here. Beautiful clay courts off of Thomas Street. Looks like they're getting ready to open. Somebody was doing a little maintenance. But the tennis club, uh, still popular. And uh, obviously, we have a lot of golf in the area. We have the, uh, this is the Belmont uh, Springs. But we also have the Oakley Country Club. We have the Arlmont Country Club that used to be up on the hill. So a lot of golf played in this area, and still is. Trivia is bowling alleys in Belmont. Anyone bowl in Belmont? OK. Where'd you bowl in Belmont? Because. Concord, OK. Because they're, they're supposedly. We, we, the historical side is, knows of five bowling alleys in Belmont. There's ads for two of them. One's over in Waverly and one's on School Street. Now those are there, the corner of school. But there is also one, the corner of Concord Avenue and Baker Street. Up in there, that section. And then um, Belmont Center in the Tudor Block, there was a bowling alley and I think it was underneath um, the drugstore there. Yes, and then Cushing Square, Cushing Avenue and Trapello Road, under Jean's Flower Shop. Anybody? Yep, right on the corner there. So some of you have bowled at these, bowled at these locations. So kind of a fun activity to be doing. And of course, this is a, a long time, before we had the Belmont-Watertown rivalry, which is you all, I'm sure, are aware of through the high school. There was another rivalry in Belmont just as, just as popular, and that is the boys from Belmont, they call it, challenging the Waverly section of town. And this was a very, they took this very serious. The boys from Belmont and from Waverly used to play football at the town field. Every year, they'd have a big, big matchup. And uh, the teams were sponsored and coached, and people were trained. And so this is a, uh, Waverly's out to redeem herself. And I guess uh, everything's all set, and they're inviting them to, again, the, the, this match. And this trophy, which is in our collection, the Belmont Historical Society, shows the, that this is the Waverly and Belmont trophy. And if Waverly won, or if Belmont won, the trophy would be displayed for the year in one of the, in that section. So if Belmont won, I think it went in Olives. And if Waverly won, it was another drugstore in Waverly, I think it. Corbett's. Corbett's, yes, sorry, Corbett's. So it was either in Corbett, depending on who the winner of this big match was. So this, um, this annual battle royal, um, this is on Thanksgiving Day. And Waverly trims Belmont six to zero. So that's, uh, that's what went on that way. And uh, funny, because the Waverly people must have been really into it that year, because it said the touchdown was made by the quarterback and coach of the Waverly team within the first few minutes of play. 
Uh, the field conditions were muddy due to the frost from the night before, but Waverly entered the field behind a band, a group of local supporters. So they had a whole big fanfare guiding them in and getting them all ready. And Belmont, no real fanfare, but uh, you see the players and the activities. And this is very uh, popular. And this went on for many years, this Waverly grudge match. Okay. Yes. Yes, high school and just other other guys. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. Anybody in the in the, in, the, in that era? Now we're looking at uh, on the playgrounds back when you were a kid growing up in Belmont. Do you remember playground activities and all the uh, arts and crafts and and uh, uh, games and sort of things that were all organized and the playgrounds were staffed with full-time staff in each location and they offered this kind of, these kind of sports, um, this kind of activities I should say. So the Underwood, the Payson, the Daniel Butler, the Zaya Kendall were open for the summer season on Monday of this week. So it's telling us what they're going to have and what the schedule is and what the, the morning session, the afternoon session, talking about. And I guess they had some basket classes in one and some um, field activities on the other. And this is just a great picture right out here in the town field, making a little pyramid. Uh, and then the closing of the season of the playgrounds of what, what uh, sports they did and annual field events. And uh, I guess these attracted uh, lots and lots of kids at the time um, to take advantage of these planned and supervised playgrounds. And of course, the Underwood Pool also. Many of you sw swam in the Underwood Pool. We have a lifeguard here <laughs> in the front row, Verna. Uh, she's a lifeguard for many years in the Underwood Pool. And you see here, it looks like a beach more beach-like, not really even like a pool. And I guess in 1923 is when they decided that um, they ended the, um, the, the water, the system. They, they changed the water system of the pool, I think, in that year. So they decided not to have this um, sort of running water, spring water fed. Let me see, what did I write about that? Yes, the pool will be filled from town water um, and, the, it, and spring water. They will discontinue the brook. So imagine it, at this time, it was more like a beach, what you think of it, it with, with um, gravel around the edges and almost like the feel of, yeah, like a beach fed by the brook. The Wellington Brook runs through there. And so the water, but they decided to change the system in 1923. Who took place? Who, who, who took part in this activity? Any of you in the doll carriage parades? Okay, doll carriage parade. This was a big popular event. On each playground, would have a um, sort of a doll carriage contest, I should say. And um, the interesting thing is, it, it was a special event. And, and they had different categories. Prettiest, best combination of girl and carriage, most original, and all these winners from these playgrounds all around Belmont would all come together at the Underwood Playground for sort of the, the uh, grand uh, awarding of, of the, so all the, the, the little winners all over town would come. So we have several pictures in our collection of these, these Unbelievable crate papered and elaborately decorated doll carriages and, and girls from, from this activity each summer. So kind of fun to remember that. And here we go. Instead of, instead of Waverly and Belmont, now we have the single men against the married men. <laughs> so... <laughs> So we have, we have a, this, this rivalry was going on for some time as well. So you see these are, these are baseball teams playing over at the town field. And um, they would have a competition, single, the single guys taking on the married guys. And it looks like by means of a home run in the eighth inning, the single men pulled it out. They came through to a six, 
to five victory over the married men. So that's kind of, again, these, these sort of sports and, and community activities that were really enjoyed by all age groups. You know, young children, the, you know, single and married and football. Lots going on in Belmont. Look at some school days. Anyone recognize this? Where, you, anyone recognize this location? This is over Payson Park Park, they call it now. That area, uh, Payson Park, because there used to be a school there, Payson Park Elementary School, and this was over in the park at Payson Park. Okay, well, let's, look at, let's look at what's happening in the school front. So they're talking about reopening on September 11th, and it seems that, what do you, what do you imagine was happening during, during this time at school? If you can remember our first section called the Town of Homes and the big boom in the population, guess what was going on in schools? Overcrowding. Giant class sizes, and that's all a result again of, of the, the 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 large increase of population that was experienced in this time. So, lots of articles talking about building an addition, building a new school, and then starting double sessions at some of the other schools. I think two of the other schools starting that. But again, this is this is because of the the big growth. They had two sessions at the Homer School, the Brighton Street School, and then they had the Payson Park, Kendall School, Daniel Butler School. So all these schools go on, uh, fill the capacity, record attendance. They had an enrollment of 2,305 pupils um, during this year, which was a, was a record, setting a record, uh, again, for, for, that, for that school year. And then again, um, Junior high, the class of 23 graduates, and they have 165 pupils, and they're described as by far the largest class ever sent out by the school. So you see a picture of the class of 23, and they're printing the names and talking about the pageant that was held. It was held in the high school assembly room, the, um, the graduation exercises, and the, the diploma is awarded and, and all that taking place by class of 23. Here we go. And now, just in case you didn't have enough football with a Waverly Belmont, now you see the water. This is a ride you're probably more familiar with. So this is taking a look at the 1923 Belmont High School football team and describing the events that's going to be taking place, the annual game with Watertown um, at the Victory Field. I think this game was played in Watertown as we switch, you know, we're alternate. So that's what's going on with the high school football. And that rivalry has been going on, I think, since 1893, it looks like. So that's, that's quite a... a a, a rivalry that dates back many years. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Okay. Now, 1923 was a, a good year for girls sports because they decided to include girls basketball as, an, as a first team um, to be organized at the school. They had the boys basketball long established. So this is taking a look from the, from the yearbook of the the, the, the girls' team that's organized. The, the, the downside of this, for my commentary, Belmont was four teams which had participated for years Newton, Chandler School of Boston, and Arlington. So they didn't, they didn't do well score-wise the first year, and I think the first couple of years, because the program needed to be established and they needed to get sort of up to speed, but at least they got the high school basketball for girls. And here we go with what we know today as called the blueprint, which is the yearbook, school yearbook. Back in 22, they started this publication. It was called the Chameleon. So this is, I think, um, 
a little note from the, those in 19, the class of 1922 saying um, they wanted to let, let the next group know, we brought him to life, now it's your turn to make him grow. What will you do? Oh, scratch his back with your inky points to limber up his year-old joints. So they were passing the baton to the next class of 23 to continue a high school yearbook, which the publication, again, we have in our collection. And so they're making a little poetry and, and, and class pictures. And this is all, again, called the chameleon. Um, and we have a collection of, a pretty full collection of high school yearbooks in the Claflin room at the library. And the good news is the library has digitized them. So now you can actually look for the information online if you have a computer and go to the library site to look at that these uh, old high school years. Very popular. People still come into the room and want to look up. And somebody asked me on the way in about uh, their brother or something about uh, high school books. Okay, and in 1923, there were some new plans and an announcement made that they were going to open a new country located on Belmont Hill, one of the sightliest spots in Belmont with a commanding view of the adjacent country for miles around. The first year, it will accommodate 50 boys. The school grounds offer every uh, facility for and the meadowlands being easily converted into athletic fields while the surrounding hills give ample opportunity for coasting and skiing. Spy Pond is accessible for rowing. What more do you want? So this is all um, in the news. And as you can see, if you go by the school today, you can see they're celebrating this year, their 100th year. So this is when this was printed in the newspaper, taking a look at what they had planned and announcing that they are going to start the school. And sure enough, we have the banner, and this is in the parking lot today, uh, commemorating their 100th year of, of activities at the Belmont School. All right, last we have um, business and commerce. So I'm going to see if you remember any of these old, old businesses. I'm sure a lot of you remember Pino's Barbershop, because Classmate of Vernie, yeah, and there he was. They, he was there for for years, years, and then we uh, got a few other remembrance. So Owens, you know, that very popular up, and they celebrated a hundred years, I think, before they went out of business, shortly before going out of business. Belmont Fruit Store, I'm not sure anyone knows where that is, and then the Belmont Taxi Service. In case you got kicked off the roads because you didn't have a driver's license, you could always. Taxi service to give you to give you a ride there. So there's some old businesses, and then uh, we couldn't leave out the dairies because Be Belmont is always thought of a market garden town with a lot of produce being loaded up every morning and sent into Faneuil Hall Marketplace, wagon after wagon. Shaw, Hittinger, she, and I mean farms all over the, the landscape in Belmont. But in addition to that, which is really surprising, is the dairies that were located in Belmont. And I think a previous newsletter, we devoted some time and space to the dairies. And at one time, there were about 13 we, we, we researched that were local, local. And so this is about the dairies. And, and they're reporting the, the total heads of cattle and the herds and the dairy cows. And so we're looking at Ross Dairy, which is probably very familiar to you over Moraine Street. So that section of town over by Agassiz Moraine, the Ross Dairy. And then this is a look at Cushing Dairy Herd. So this is probably uh, in, the, in, the, in what would have been Cushing Square now. These, these cows are probably grazing along where the business district is now in Cushing Square. That's a Cushing Dairy Herd. And then the milk analysis. So they're breaking down and talking about um, the bacteria counts, the fats and solids. So this is a board of health publishing, a milk inspector publishing all the information on all these small and prominent dairies around Belmont. So kind of interesting, again, like Beals Dairy, um, Ross, Shaughnessy Brothers. Um, what's the other one that was? 
you know, there was one on White Street. There was a whole bunch of little so, sort of um, where, where dairy, yeah, all these, all these little um, sort of outcroppings of dairy. That was public. Oh, and I got the pigs, sorry. Uh, swine in Belmont. I hope they mean pigs. <laughs> I, yeah. But anyways, there's 600 of them, swine. And the number of piggeries is 10, which amazed me. Because you know that the Houston farm, which is now down by the Belmont, used to be the Belmont Uplands, which is down by Royal Belmont now, that area was a big pig farm. That's a Houston family, and they had um, quite a significant um, business of breeding and pigs. But this is saying that we have 10 piggeries in Belmont. So these might have been, again, smaller herds or smaller sections around town. So yeah, swine in Belmont. All right, um, here we go with uh, Waverly Co-op Bank, and they were established 1886 over in the Waverly area, but they're gonna build a new building. So they're here, they're gonna laying of the cornerstone, and they're gonna break ground for their new structure uh, over on, I think it's on Church Street, Church Street, that area. And so they're announcing the event um, and what, what you can expect Contract was awarded for the handsome structure, yes, and replacing the, pro the, the present block of stores. So that's a, something that took place in 1923. Okay, another quick one with a bunch of businesses. And we have McGinnis Coal, and that was over on the tracks there. They had a little spur off of where the car wash is today, over in the Waverly section. Richardson Farm, and, and I'm sure that's, there's a Richardson Farm district that we still have in town and that's the last working farm in Belmont so probably relatives of generations and then I threw in one for Marsha the trend home and trend home was another real estate and builder and funny because uh, Marsha and I've been working in the Claflin room and the evenings on Tuesdays and uh, every week it seems to be has another little cartoon talking about buying a house, you know, don't wait, and all sorts of little tips and tricks, and see, today if you buy it, if you wait a year, what's gonna happen? So all these little uh, cartoon things that we look forward to finding in the newspaper, and that was all done by Trenholm, um, and they were in the Belmont Center area. Okay, and Studebaker, back to cars again, and this was on um, Trapello Road, and they're talking about the popularity of this particular model and how many thousand cars were being produced, Studebakers, and uh, 15,000 cars a month. And they ranged in price from 975 to 2750. I guess that would be about 10 years of hats for me. So you notice they didn't get a Studebaker. But this was a very popular model, and they had this dealer in Belmont. Why not investigate yourself? You can call for a demonstration and become convinced by the actual contact with the Studebaker car. So that was all going, uh, going on on Trapello Road, the Studebaker uh, industry, and the car dealer on sort of auto mile on that stretch of uh, Trapello Road. And here we are. Uh, last but not least, we have Corbett's. We talked about Corbett's. Uh, many, many of you grew up with Alexander Corbett, first, second, and third, and they ran this business over in uh, Waverly. But I'm sure you didn't know about uh, ladies. This is for the ladies now. Mrs. Jackson is coming. And Mrs. Jackson is a toilet goods specialist who succeeded in her profession. And she's gonna be here for two weeks and you can call up and get a demonstration in your own home free of charge. She arrives July 9th and she'll be with us until July 15th. And she will be glad to show you how you can retain or restore the original attractiveness of your skin. So there you have it. So, uh, Corbett has teamed up with uh, Mrs. Jackson and invited her to Belmont 
to make us uh, all more radiant. So that's, uh, that's the, the last slide of 1923. And so I thank you for, for, for going through the year in pictures. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Yes, we have, we have files on Civil War veterans, definitely. We, we do, um, and we, we, did, we did feature the ones that were deceased um, some time ago, it, but we, we do have veterans. We, we have lots of f folders on individuals, and depending on... No, I think, I, I think, in their 70s or 80s. yes, and I think there were. There were three that come to mind that are, there, there's a picture of them in um, Belmont Images book. I think one of them was a frost, one of them was a, um, off the top of my head, I, I can't remember the, but yes, we had several that took, took place in these kinds of celebrate, the, those kind of Memorial Day celebrations for, for many years. Yeah, march and parades and yeah, but we should have some files and information if if you're interested in specific people. All right, other questions that come yeah. Uh, I think I read that the Benton Branch Library was a child. It was, yeah. School that yeah. School yeah. School yes. School. Is that yes, correct. She's talking about the Benton Branch Library. Yes. I told you there were four owners of the mansion Belmont. So it started with Mr. Cushing and then Mr. Payson. Uh, had it, that's why Payson's, but then we had Benjamin Harding, and Benjamin Harding, when he, he bought the property, and he used it as a boys' school for the Episcopal Church, so he was a training boys in, with the Episcopal Church, and during that time, they built the chapel, and interesting, they built the chapel out of field stones, so the boys, the students gathered the field stones and put them in place and had the chapel, and they built it one of the students who died. So that's what, what, how it was built and why. And so that was part of the property of the um, larger property. And then through the years when it went to the past to the Benton family, they gifted it to the town uh, to use as a library. That's great, great question. Any more questions and comments? All right. Yeah, yeah. Good. All right. Good. No, that's 